All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Daniel chapter 11, and we're going to talk about Antiochus and the Antichrist again. Uh, it's going to be revisited in this chapter. Uh, an introduction here is this chapter contains one of the most specifically fulfilled prophecies of the Bible. It predicts history over some 375 years and to the end with amazing accuracy. The chapter is so specific that many critics who deny supernatural revelation have insisted that it is history, written after the fact, fraudulently claiming to be prophecy. Because of the detail of the prophecy, we will be forced to frequently summarize and the fulfillment of the prophecy will be observed as it is described. So commentator... Joyce Baldwin will explain the mindset of the late daters, the people that say it's not prophecy, right? You're non-believers. So though all of this is presented as if it were future, the considered opinion of most scholars is that the writer was using an accepted literary form which would have deceived no one. The intention would be to show that the course of history was under God's direction and so achieving God's purposes. And when the history becomes prophecy, the transition can be detected because events proved him wrong. And so such a view must undermine confidence in the entire book. If the late dating theory is correct, then the so-called revelation was in fact nothing of the sort. And it follows that the preparation for the vision in chapter 10 was also a fiction put in as local color for the sake of effect. But Daniel was translated into the Septuagint, uh, 285 to 247 BC. So how can you explain its later translation of prophecy if it was translated from the Hebrew to the Greek in the Septuagint. You understand what I'm saying? So, let's look at, uh, let's get into verse 2. We left off chapter 10 with the first verse of chapter 11. So we're going to pick up at verse 2 of chapter 11, speaking about the division of the Greek Empire. We're going to speak about the four future kings here. All right. Verse 2. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. So simply the angel is telling Daniel that there would be three more kings in Persia until a fourth arose. The fourth king is going to be strong, rich, and oppose the realm of Greece. This rich fourth king was fulfilled in the Persian king Xerxes. And so in fulfillment, there was actually four kings from the time that Daniel spoke until Xerxes, the one who did stir up all against the realm of Greece. Either the angel omitted the current king, Cyrus, looking only to the future, or he ignored King Smyrdas of Persia from 522 to 521 BC because he ruled less than one year and was an imposter to the throne. Uh, these visions and insights regarding the future of the Persian and Greek empires were relevant because each empire attempted to wipe out the people of God at some time. The Persian Empire tried to wipe out the Jewish people during the reign of Xerxes through the plot, uh, the plot of Haman, as shown in the book of Esther. You will remember that from our commentary in the book of Esther. The Greek Empire tried to wipe out the Jewish people during the time uh, the reign of Antiochus IV when he attempted to kill every Jew who did not renounce their commitment to God and embrace Greek culture. Okay, verse 3 and 4, the rise of a mighty king. Verse 3, Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. But not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others besides these. So the angel told Daniel of a mighty king with great dominion, but his kingdom would not endure. It would be divided after the death of a mighty king. And that's fulfilled in Alexander the Great, who had certainly was a mighty king. Alexander died at 32 years of age of a fever after a drunken party in Babylon. 
This prophecy does not mainly concern Alexander because he did no harm to Jerusalem, though he conquered the general area. The ancient historian Josephus uh, records the interesting arrival of Alexander the Great to Jerusalem, and how he was shown the book of Daniel by the high priest, whom Alexander had previously seen in a vision, and Alexander was so impressed that he spared Jerusalem and granted it religious toleration. Right, And that's... uh, In Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 11, Chapter 8. So, not among his posterity. So, after Alexander's death, none of his descendants succeeded him. It wasn't for lack of trying. Alexander did leave three possible heirs. A half-brother named Philip, who was mentally deficient. A son who was born after Alexander died. And an illegitimate son named Hercules. The half-brother and the posthumous son were first designated co-monarchs, each with a regent, but fighting amongst the regents eventually resulted in the murder of all possible heirs. So after the death of all Alexander's possible heirs, four generals controlled the Greek Empire, but none of them according to his, Alexander's, dominion. The rest of the prophecy will focus on two of the four inheritors of Alexander's realm and the dynasties they established. Only two are focused on because they constantly fought over the promised land because it sat between their centers of power. Verse 5, the strength of the king of the south. Verse 5, also the king of the south shall become strong as well as one of his princes and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. So one of these four inheritors of the empire of the mighty king would become stronger and greater than the others. This is fulfilled in Ptolemy I of Egypt, who exerted his control over the Holy Land. Soon after the division of Alexander's empire, the Ptolemies dominated this region. Ptolemy I had a prince named Seleucus, who rose to power and took dominion over the region of Syria. He became more powerful than his former Egyptian ruler. And the Seleucids are identified with the kings of the north, and Ptolemies were the kings of the south. And so the dynasties of the Seleucid and the uh, Ptolemies fought for some 130 years, and the stronger of the two always held dominion over the Holy Land. All right, verse 6, a marriage between the families of the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Verse 6, at the end of some years they shall join forces. For the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand, but she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who strengthened her in those times. So joined by a marriage, the kings of the north and south would be allies for a while, but the arrangement would not last. And this was fulfilled in the marriage between Antiochus II of the Seleucids and uh, Berenice, the daughter of Ptolemy II. There was peace for a time because of this marriage, but it was upset when Ptolemy II died. And once he died, Antiochus II put away uh, Berenice and took back his former wife, uh, Laodis. Laodice didn't trust her husband, Antiochus II, so she had him poisoned. After the murder of Antiochus II, Laodice had Berenice, her infant son, and her attendants killed. Uh, after this reign of terror, Laodice set her son, Seleucus II, on the throne of the Syrian dominion. All right, verse 7 through 9. So from the south, an army defeats the kingdom of the north. Verse 7. But from a branch of her roots shall one arise in his place who shall come with an army enter the fortress of the king of the north and deal with them and prevail he shall also carry their gods captive to egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold and he shall continue more years than the king of the north also the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south but shall return to his own land <clears throat> so the angel's telling Daniel that the branch of her roots is going to come from the south and prevail over the kings of the north. That's fulfilled in Ptolemy the Third, who was the brother of Berenice, the branch of her roots. Avenging the murder of his sister, Ptolemy the Third invaded Syria and he humbled Seleucus the Second. Ptolemy the Third lived four years past Seleucus the Second. Alright, verse ten. The sons of the king of the north and their victory. Verse ten. 
However, his sons shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. So the sons of the kings of the north would continue the battle. One of the sons would conquer the Holy Land, which stood as a buffer between the kings of the south and the kings of the north. This is fulfilled in Seleucus III and Antiochus III. The two sons of Seleucus II, both were successive generals, um, or successful. Uh, but Seleucus III ruled only a short time, and he was succeeded by his brother. In this furious battle, Antiochus III takes back the Holy Land from the dominion of the Ptolemies. All right, verse 11 and 12. The king of the south gains an upper hand over the king of the north. All right, verse 11. And the king of the south shall be moved with rage and go out and fight with him with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude. But the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. And when he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up and he will be cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. Right? He's going to cast down tens of thousands, but he's not going to prevail. And so... <clears throat> The angel tells Daniel that the king of the south is going to attack and meet with a great multitude of soldiers from the king of the north. The king of the north is going to lose in battle and his multitude would be defeated. And that happened when Antiochus III was defeated at the battle of Raphia. Because of that loss, he was forced to give back dominion over the holy land to Ptolemy IV. <clears throat> All right, verse 13 through 16. The king of the north and his occupation of the glorious land. Verse 13, For the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. Now in those times many shall rise up against the king of the south. Also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and build a siege mound and take a fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist, but he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. So the angel tells Daniel that this northern dynasty would answer back and defeat the king of the south in an extended siege. This victory is going to give the king of the north dominion over the glorious land. And so, this is fulfilled when Antiochus III invaded Egypt again, gaining final control over the armies of Ptolemy V over the Holy Land. Jews living in the Holy Land helped Antiochus III defeat the king of the south. This is because the Jewish people resented the rule of the Egyptian Ptolemies. Uh, the Jewish people in the Glorious Land initially welcomed Antiochus III as a liberator from Egyptian rule. Their decision to support Antiochus III proved unwise when he turned destruction upon the glorious land and its people. All right. Verse 17. The king of the south is going to give his daughter to the king of the north. Verse 17. So he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus he shall do, and he shall give his daughter of women to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or before him. So the king of the north who rules over the holy land is going to attempt to dominate and destroy the king of the south. He's going to make an attempt by giving the king of the south a daughter of women to destroy. That plot wasn't going to work. And this is fulfilled when Antiochus III gave his daughter Cleopatra to Ptolemy V of Egypt. He did this hoping to gain permanent influence and eventually control uh, Egypt. Uh, to great disappointment of Antiochus III, the plan did not succeed because... Cleopatra wasn't faithful to her Egyptian husband at all. Uh, this is not the most famous Cleopatra from ancient history, but this is the ancestor of a more famous Cleopatra. The more famous Egyptian woman lived some 100 years after the time of this Cleopatra. All right, just to clarify. All right, verse 18 and 19, the king of the north is stopped and he stumbles. Verse 18, after this, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall take many. But a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end. And with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. Then he shall turn his face towards the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. So after the disappointing effort through the daughter Cleopatra, the king of the north would turn his efforts towards the coastlands, and he was stopped by one formerly under reproach until he stumbled and fell and not be found. 
and that is fulfilled when Antiochus III turned his attention towards the areas of Asia Minor and Greece. Uh, he was helped by Hannibal, the famous general from Carthage, but a Roman general, Lucius Cornelius Scripo, uh, Scripio, uh, defeated Antiochus in Greece. Antiochus planned to humiliate Greece, but was humiliated instead. And so he returned to his former regions, Antiochus, having lost everything that he gained, and he died shortly thereafter. And so after this defeat, Antiochus III had this inglorious end. He needed money badly for his treasury. He resorted to pillaging a Babylonian temple, and he was killed by the enraged local citizens. All right, verse 20. The brief reign of the succeeding king of the north. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he's going to be destroyed uh, he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. So after the inglorious end of the king of the north, his successor is going to raise taxes, and he's going to soon end. That's fulfilled in the brief reign of Seleucus III. He's the eldest son of Antiochus III. He sought to tax his dominion to increase revenues. His plan to pillage the Jerusalem temple was set aside when his ambassador had an angelic vision of warning. Uh, he was assassinated. Uh, probably by his brother Antiochus the fourth. All right, verse twenty-one. Antiochus the fourth, known as Antiochus Epiphanes, a vile person. Right, the vile person is going to come to power. So now we're we're finally getting getting somewhere. Verse twenty-one. And in his place shall arise a vile person, to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. So the angel is telling Daniel that after this brief reign of the former king of the north, the next king is going to be a vile person. He wouldn't be recognized as royalty, but he's going to take power by intrigue. Uh, this is fulfilled in the successor of Seleucus III, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, you know, the Antiochus IV. He did not come to the throne legitimately because it was strongly suspected that he murdered his older brother, the previous king. Uh, and Seleucus, the son of Seleucus III, was imprisoned in Rome, uh, who was the other heir to the throne. So apart from the murder of his older brother, Antiochus IV didn't use terror to gain power. He used flattery, smooth promises. Uh, he flattered people in order to get their assistance, like the Romans, ambassadors to court their favor, uh, to pay them uh, in tribute, so Antiochus the Fourth took the title Epiphanes, meaning you know illustrious. Uh, others derisively calls him Epimanes, meaning you know madman. Right. Verse twenty-two through twenty-seven: the vile person fails to conquer the king of the south. Verse twenty-two: with the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken. And also the prince of the covenant, and after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully. For he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably, even into the richest places of the province. And he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil, and riches. He shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. He shall stir up his power and his courage against the kings of the south with the great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand. For they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat the portion of his delicacy shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table, but it shall not prosper, for the end will be at the appointed time. So the angel is telling Daniel that this new king of the north, the vile person of uh, verse 21, would attempt a deceitful covenant with the king of the south. This would fail, and there's going to be a great battle that would not change the balance of power. That happened when Antiochus Epiphanes carried on a feud between the you know dynasties, but pretended friendship and alliance to catch them uh, off guard. And despite massive efforts and epic battles, Antiochus Epiphanes did not stand, and his army was swept away. And his defeat at his second campaign against Egypt was important because Egypt beat Antiochus with the help of Rome. 
At the end of it all, Antiochus Epiphanes and his kingdom were under the dominion of Rome. And in a famous battle, the Roman navy defeated the navy of Antiochus Epiphanes. And after this battle, the Roman general drew a circle around Antiochus in the dirt and demanded to know if he would surrender and pay tribute to Rome and demanded to know before he stepped out of the circle. From that point on, there was no doubt that he took his orders from Rome and was under Roman dominion. And uh, people that ate the portion of his delicacies are going to destroy him. That's fulfilled in the treachery against Antiochus IV by his own counselors. All right, verse 28 through 35, the vile person turns on the holy land with violence. Verse 28, while returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant. So he shall do damage and return to his own land. At the appointed time, he shall return and go towards the south. But it shall not be like the former or the latter, for ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant, and forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Those who do wickedly against the covenant he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white, until the time of the end, because it's still for the appointed time. And so when this vile person returns to his land, he's going to attack the land people and temple of Israel. It'll be a time of great courage and great treachery among the people of God. Uh, that's fulfilled when Antiochus Epiphanes returned from Egypt. He was bitter from defeat, obviously. He vented his anger against Jerusalem, which was already shaken up because Antiochus sold the office of high priest and persecuted the Jewish people to conform to Greek culture, forsaking the faith and traditions of their fathers. In failing in his invasion of Egypt, uh, Antiochus returns home with only the great plunder to soothe his wounded pride. Um, there's the naval assistance from the Romans, the ships from Cyprus, who helped the Egyptians turn back Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes set up the image of Zeus at the temple altar. He demanded sacrifice to this image, and he, then he desecrated the temple by sacrificing a pig on it. It was in truth an abomination which brought a desolate condition to the temple, for now nobody would come worship at all. And when Antiochus Epiphanes turned on Jerusalem, the Jewish people were divided. Some forsook the covenant with God and embraced Greek culture. And those who knew their God and made a stand for righteousness uh, had to face incredible persecution. So in his attack on Jerusalem, Antiochus IV is said to have killed about 80,000 Jews. He took about 40,000 more as prisoners. He sold another 40,000 as slaves. And he plundered the temple, robbing it of approximately $1 billion by modern calculations. And, uh, you know, until the time of the end, because it's still for the appointed time, this terror could only last for as long as God had appointed it. And God had a purpose even for such persecution and blasphemy. All right, verse 36, the Antichrist, the end times Antiochus Epiphanes, right? The willful king, a shift to a future fulfillment. Verse 36, then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. So the angel explained to Daniel that this king would blaspheme God and exalt himself until the wrath has been accomplished and what has been determined shall be done. Uh, so here we're shifting from what was fulfilled in the Ptolemies and Seleucids to what will be fulfilled in the Antichrist, this final world dictator. Daniel was told that this revelation pertained to the latter days in chapter 10 verse 14. And chapter 11, verse 36, begins to look more forward uh, towards this final world dictator, who is a sort of the last days Antiochus Epiphanes. 
And so we know that everything about this prophecy was not fulfilled during the career of Antiochus Epiphanes. Right? He's going to be a type of the final world ruler. Jesus specifically said the real abomination of desolation was still in the future in Matthew 24, verse 15. The Apostle Paul paraphrased, uh, paraphrased Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 in reference to the coming Antichrist. He says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. All right, so Antiochus Epiphanes is very important, but mostly as a historical preview of the Antichrist. This is why so much space is given to describing this career of one evil man, uh, and to be honest, when it comes to history, Antiochus Epiphanes is like a tiny blip on the radar. Uh, but because he prefigures the ultimate evil man, Antiochus Epiphanes is the trailer version, right? If it's a movie, it'd be the trailer released well before the Antichrist, who would be like the feature event. <clears throat> And to be honest, if Antiochus Epiphanes was like a, a nobody, a, you know, a blip on the radar, then I also assume that the Antichrist will also be a dodo. You know, most, much like Hitler was a giant failure through his career and then rose to power, you know, through the, the, the Nazi party. But I think the Antichrist will also be this quote unquote, um, you know, influential, you know, smooth tongue. Everybody expects him to be like this genius. But if you look at what society really you know, puts on the pedestal today, uh, the Antichrist is probably just going to be a total dodo um, that everybody embraces, you know, that um, they'll just take in. This guy's going to solve all our problems, you know, and it'll, for whatever reason. <clears throat> but I don't think he's going to be as, uh, it's always pictured like he's like this genius, smooth talker. But um, Antiochus Epiphanes is our Old Testament type to kind of give us a viewpoint here. Uh, historical preview of the Antichrist, right? So Antiochus Epiphany certainly did this in general, exalt himself and magnify himself above gods, uh, every god. And he did this in the general sense that all sinners will oppose God. Yet Antiochus remains loyal to the Greek religious tradition, which revered the entire Olympian pantheon. Antiochus Epiphanes put a statue of Zeus in the temple, not of himself. This statement will be more precisely fulfilled in the Antichrist, who sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All right, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. So any, the Antichrist is going to do a lot of damage, but he is on a short chain, and it will only do... It'll only work into God's plan, right? God's purpose is going to be accomplished. All right, verse 37 to 39, the character and authority of this willful king. Verse 37, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with the foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. So based on all this, some Bible scholars believe that the Antichrist is going to be of a Jewish descent. Um, some will say that he'll be a homosexual, right? He, he will regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. Uh, these things may not be popularly known about the man, but they could be true nonetheless. And there are... Uh, Many commentators believe that the, the desire of women refers to Jesus and that all women desire the honor of bearing the Messiah and understanding desire as it's used in Haggai chapter 2 verse 7, seeing the desire of women as Jesus makes the most sense in light of the flow of the context. Uh, and the Antichrist is going to take and hold power with military might and the shrewd use of great riches. All right. <clears throat> All right, verse 40 through 45, the final conflict. Verse 40. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. 
He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels, but news from the east and north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and nobody will help him. So the angel's describing to Daniel a confederation of kings coming against this great leader with a battle in or near the Holy Land. And prophetically speaking, a precise identification of people mentioned is difficult. The king of the south may be Egypt or represent the Arab community. The king of the north may be the Antichrist domain as the new Antiochus Epiphanes, or it could be Russia. Uh, the precise points could be cloudy here, but the general idea is clear. The end is going to be marked by great conflict, culminating in the world's armies gathering in the promised land to do final battle. So in the end, there's no hope for the Antichrist or for any of his followers. So verses 40 through 45 seem to outline the Armageddon scenario of the final conflict, climaxing in Revelation chapter 16 and 19. Uh, chapter 12 continues with a clear description of the tribulation period. All right, and that should be chapter 11. Thank you for joining me.